Hey, welcome everyone to the virtual commutative algebra seminar of IIT Bombay. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Ryo Takahashi from Nagoya University in Japan. And today he will speak on getting a module from another and classifying resolving subcategories. So over to you, Ryo. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. Okay, can you hear, can you, all of you hear my Speaking. Yes. Okay, okay, so thank you very much so, uh, for inviting me to speak here. So I'm very happy. So today I, I will speak about um, uh, getting a modules. Uh, so given two modules, uh, how can we get one from other? And it, I will also relate it to the classification problem of resolving subcategories. Okay, let me start. So, um, uh, let R be a uh, commutative Nesselian ring, and all R modules are assumed to be finitely generated. So, uh, our main question is here. So, let M and N be two R modules. And then, can we, so we want to consider whether we can get N from M by taking direct summons, series, and extensions. So these are three operations. And I believe uh, all of you know the definition of a direct summand. Um, but so um, for safety, I let me remind you of the definitions of series and extensions. So if there is a short exact sequence of the form, of this form, uh, with P projective, then the left module N is called the first city of the right module M. And it is denoted by omega M. Okay. And we can also define the N city inductively, and it is denoted by omega N M. And also if there is a short exact sequence of this form, then the middle term e, is called an extension of the other two modules. So this, these are the definitions of series and extensions. And now I, I think I think you can understand the meaning of this question. Okay. So let's let let's consider this the question by using some concrete examples. So for this, let me uh, let let R be a polynomial ring in two variables x and y over a field k. Then for an R module M, uh, we set the bracket of M to denote to be the collection of R modules that can be got from M by taking those three operations, namely direct summons, series and extension. And then our question asks, just asks whether N belongs to the bracket of M for given two modules M and N. Okay. So let's consider this example. So example one. So we want to uh, think of this containment. So the left hand side is the idea generated by X squared and Y. And the right hand side is the bracket of arm of x y. So we can ask if the this idea belongs to the bracket of this module. And to think about this, uh, we first uh, consider the natural short exact sequence here. And this the first map is just an inclusion map, and the co the co kernel is its uh, co kernel, yeah, arm of x y. And then the left module here, so x, y mod x squared and y, uh, is uh, generated by the residue class of x, right? So it's a cyclic module. And it is easy to check that uh, it is isomorphic to uh, arm of x, y. So um, uh, the middle module, so the module here, arm of x squared and y, is an extension not the left module and the right module, but 
they, they are the same. So uh, both are R mod xy. So R mod x squared and squared and y belongs to the bracket of R mod xy. On the other hand, uh, our target, the idea generated by x squared and y, uh, is the, the none other than the first CDG of R mod x squared and y, because there is a surjection from R to R mod x squared and y, uh, whose kernel is this idea. So it again comes to the bracket of R mod x y. So and this question has an affirmative answer. So the answer is yes, right? Okay, so let's consider the next example, so example two. So now we want to consider if R mod X times Y belongs to the bracket of R mod X or not. Okay. So to, to, uh, to get uh, uh, this containment or not, uh, I, we assume that this containment holds true. So assume that R mod X times Y belongs to the bracket of R mod X. Then take the localization at the prime idea generated by Y. Then, as you know, localization is a flat operation. So I mean, localization define, uh, gives a flat map. So it's localization, in other words, localization gives an exact factor. So it com commutes with taking direct summons, citizens, and extensions. So we still get the same type of containment here after localization. Okay. Then the left hand side, this one, this one is nothing but the, uh, this one is uh, isomorphic to the uh, rescue field of the prime idea generated by Y. And uh, and wh what is the right hand side? So the right hand side is the bracket of R mod X localized at the prime idea or generated Y Y, but this module is zero because the prime idea or generated Y Y does not support uh, does not support this module R mod X, right? So it is zero. So the right hand side is the bracket of the zero module. What is it? So recall that the definition of the bracket. So it is the correction of modules obtained from, uh, from the module here uh, by taking direct summons, CDs, and extensions. But now this module is zero. So uh, we only get projective modules, okay? So this one, so the right-hand right side, right side consists of projective modules. Therefore, uh, the restive field of Y, uh, so this mean, this implies that the restive field of Y is a projective module over the localization, but it is not true. So this contradiction shows that the question is negative. So the negative answer. So the answer is no, right? Okay, so this is the second example. And so then next, what if the what we what if we swap these two modules? R mod x uh, is R mod x in the bracket of R mod x y. We can see uh, if we can see that this holds true be, uh, by constructing such a short exact sequence. So there is a short exact sequence with this form. R mod x y R mod x plus R mod x squared x y squared and R mod x y, and uh, these the maps f and g here are uh, given by these. Okay. So this short is a sequence uh, says that the mid the our target R mod x is a is a direct summand of the middle module of the of this short is a sequence. Uh, which is the extension of R mod X, Y. So R mod X is a direct summand of an extension of R mod X, Y. So this containment holds true. So the example, uh, so the question has an affirmative answer. So answer is yes, okay. 
However, um, in general, it's very hard <laughs> to find such a short data sequence. Okay. So we are just lucky here to find such a short data sequence so that we can see the containment holes too. So in, in general, we don't know if there exists such a short data sequence, or even if there exists, there even if there does exist such a short data sequence, perhaps we cannot find such a such a short data sequence. So we want a criterion. We want a criterion for given two modules M and N to have the, the containment here. So N belongs to the bracket of M. So we want such a criteria. And to do this, uh, it's um, effective to uh, think of the problem categorically. So that's why we introduce the no this notation, so model, uh, to denote the category of finitely generated car modules. If you are not familiar with categ category theory, uh, you can just think of uh, this as the collection of finitely generated R modules or the set of finitely generated modules. Of course, uh, modules that do not consist of, uh, do not define a set, but uh, we can, it is, so there is no problem. So just, and this is the collection of modules. And then let me, uh, so let's uh, recall the definition of uh, resolving subcategory. So this notion was introduced by Arslander and Bridger in 1969. So a resolving subcategory of model R uh, is by definition a true subcategory of uh, closed undertaking direct summons, ex series and extensions. So our three operations. Okay. And then, uh, so let me, uh, so first, let me remark that uh, any resolving subcategory contains uh, projective modules. In, in, the, in, in this talk, I only consider uh, non-empty subcategories. So if you are given a subcategory, it, con it contains some module. Then if it is closed under taking direct summons, then zero module belongs to that subcategory. And then if it is closed under series, then uh, any projective module belongs to the, the subcategory because any projective module is a CDG, first series of a, a zero module. So any resolving subcategory contains the projective modules. On the other hand, uh, the projective module, uh, the projective modules themselves uh, define uh, resolving subcategory here. So we denote by proj R the collection, precisely speaking, the subcategory consisting of projective R modules. This is a resolving itself, a resolving subcategory itself, because uh, any pro so projectivity is uh, stable or preserved by taking these these three operations. Okay, so <coughs> the projective mod the proj R is itself a resolving subcategory. So in this, uh, that means that uh, the project proj R is the, is the smallest resolving subcategory. There are many other uh, examples of a resolving subcategory. For example, uh, here, FPDR, which denotes the collection of R modules of finite projective dimension. It is again, the resolving subcategory because uh, being of finite projective dimension is again preserved by taking these three operations. And similarly, if the ring R is coin Macaulay, then the subcategory consisting of maximum coin Macaulay modules is resolving. Because if R is coin Macaulay, then R is itself here. R is itself a maximum coin Macaulay module. And Again, the MCM property is preserved by these three operations. So CMR, you know, uh, CMR is also resolving subcategory. Okay, so uh, so now because that 
our bracket, so the bracket of M is the resolving subcategory generated by M, uh, which means that the bracket of M is the smallest resolving subcategory of mod R containing N. Okay, so it is resolving by definition. So, um, uh, uh, so if so, such a criterion, so we want uh, is would be obtained if we can classify all the resolving subcategories of mod R. Okay, if we can classify all the resolving subcategories of mod R, then probably we will be able to get more information on the structure of each resolving subcategory, including such bracket M. Then probably we, we will get some more information on the containment on here, on the containment here. So this is the motivation to, to study classification problem of resolving subcategories. So now, from now on, uh, we will think about classifying resolving subcategories. And first, um, we we will uh, think of the resolving subcategories satisfying some conditions. So here, the first one is uh, contravariant finiteness. Okay. So uh, definition here. So as as so this so this notion is int was introduced by Arthur and Smeiro in 1980. So let X be a subcategory of mod R, and um, to define contravariant finiteness, finiteness, uh, we first need to define uh, we need to uh, define the notion of a right approximation. So let M be an R module. Then a hom homomorphism. F from X to M with X being in the subcategory X uh, is called a right X approximation of M if the, such a diagram is commutative. This diagram is commutative. Here, F is here, the map F is here. And if you have a similar map F prime to F, so F prime is, a, is also a homomorphism from X prime to M, X, uh, where X prime is in the subcategory X. Then such a, such a map factors through F. Namely, uh, there exists a homomorphism from X prime to X, uh, G, such that F prime is equal to the composition of F with G. So this is the definition of a right approximation. And then uh, we say that X is contravariantly finite if uh, every R module has a right approximation with respect to X. So this is the definition of a contravariantly finite subcategory. So it, contravariantly finite subcategory is a notion uh, in the uh, dealt with in the representation theory of algebras. So probably not so many people know, not so many of you know this notion. But in fact, uh, we have, uh, uh, we know a contravariant finite subcategory. So here, so, so, for, so let me explain this. So a right, what is a right project R approximation? So we call that the project R is the subcategory of projective R modules. What is a right project R approximation? It is uh, it is no other than a surjective homomorphism from a projective module. Okay. Because uh, if X is projective here, and if F is if if F is surjective, then uh, F satisfies this property, right? Any projective module to any homomorphism from a projective module to M factors through X or F. Okay? This is this comes from the, just the definition of a projective module. 
So a right project R approximation is a surjective homomorphism from a projective module and vice versa. So, and of, of course, all of you know, all of us know that uh, any module for any module M, there is a surjective homomorphism from a projective module to M. Okay, so and this means that a project R is contravariant invariant. So this is the most typical example of a contravariant infinite with open subcategory. All right. So uh, so here is another example. So this is due to uh, Arsland and Buchweiz, uh, which was proved in 1989. So they proved that each module M over a uh, Gorenstein local ring admits an exact sequence of this form. And uh, here, the middle term is maximal quantum quality, and the left term is of finite projective dimension. Okay, so this this is ver a very celebrated theorem in, even in commutative algebra, I think. So this is sometimes called the koi makori approximation theorem. And this theorem especially says that CMR is a contravariant to finite resolving subcategory. Indeed, this map here, so the map from X to M, is a right CMR approximation. We can easily show this by using a uh, long exact sequence of X modules. Okay. So I, I mean x1, x1 of MCM module to uh, against a module of finite projective dimension vanishes. So this fun, this basic fact shows that uh, the map from X to M is a right CMR approximation. So here is another example of a contravariant finite resolving subcategory. <laughs> okay, so but um, uh, so let me remark uh, one fact, uh, which is not directly related to this talk, but um, actually, a contra as I said, contravariant finite subcategory is an in very important in the representation theory of algebras, and the most uh, important property uh, or fact uh, is here. So this is due to us and then writing. Okay. So actually, uh, this paper. Um, so you know. Uh, so I think all of you know Auslander, Maurice Auslander, and he published uh, more than one hundred papers, and uh, most of them are famous. But uh, this paper is, I think, most cited one, except books. Okay. So this paper. Was, this paper is very so. In this sense, this paper is very important in the representation theory of algebras. So they proved that, or they gave a, gave a classification of contravariant finite resolving subcategories over an Artin algebra, uh, which is not necessarily commutative, but have uh, but has finite global dimension. So, in, in more precisely, they construct a one-to-one -one correspondence between contravariant to finite resolving subcategories and so-called cotillotin modules. So, by by this classification, um, uh, it turned out that contravariant to finite resolving subcategories are closely related to the so-called tilting theory. It's kind of uh, Morita theory, and then. Uh, this notion has become very important. Okay. But in commutative algebra, it is not so not so famous, so the contravariant finiteness. But when I was a, I think I when I was a postdoc or just at, at the beginning of uh, my assistant professor position, uh, I proved this theorem A. So let R be a Hensley and Gorenstein local ring. Then the, uh, the contravariant finite resolving subcategories are just these three subcategories ProGR, CMR, and Modal. 
Uh, we already know that PROJ are CMR, uh, contour variant with finite resolving some categories, and MOD R is the uh, uh, trivial one. So this is always a uh, contour variant with finite resolving subcategory. So these three uh, contained in the left hand side, but I proved this equality. So they are only, so no other contour variant with finite resolving subcategory appears over a Hensley and Gorenstein local. Okay. So uh, let me uh, explain some application of theorem A. So actually we, we can get the characterization of simple singularities in terms of totally efficient models. So let R be a commu uh, complete, of course, commutative local ring uh, with algebraic A cross the residue field of characteristic zero. Then um, uh, the methods of theorem A recovers uh, this corollary, this result. This is also my my result uh, obtained in my joint work with Lars Christensen, Greg Kepmeyer, and Janet Strilly. Um, so uh, actually, uh, four of us were, so when we proved this theorem, uh, four of us are uh, all uh, postdocs. And I, I hear that this theorem is called uh, postdoc theorem in the US. <laughs> I don't know if he is still <laughs> um, uh, valid, but uh, at that time, around, around that around this, uh, around 2008, um, it was called a postdoc theorem. So we proved that R is a simple singularity if there exists one, at least one, but only finitely many non free indecomposable total efficiency modules. So I don't give the definition of a totally efficient module, but it is also called a module of Orenstein dimension zero or G dimension zero. And uh, there, uh, there is a deep theory on these modules, th these modules. Okay. So wh what is a simple singularity? So simple singularity is uh, roughly speaking, roughly speaking, simple singularity is a uh, hypersurfaces that deform to ADN singularities. Uh, that means that um, uh, if if you take uh, if you model out by a suitable regular sequence, then it, it becomes an ADE singularity. So such a hypersurface is called a simple singularity. So, for example, if in dimension two, a simple singularity, uh, the same as uh, so-called uh, rational double points, which are also called Kleinian singularities or dual singularities, and there are many names meaning the same thing. So th these are simple singularities. And here is a very <laughs> rough outline of the proof. So there exists only one, uh, at least one, but only finitely many in the composable non-free total reflexive modules. Then we can see that the total reflexive modules form a contravariant to finite resolving subcategory. So we can apply our method uh, behind theorem A to deduce that R is Gorenstein. Of course, in this part, and there are many, many arguments, but we can deduce that R is Gorenstein. Then uh, uh, we can reduce. So we can de deduce R is Gorenstein and we can reduce to the following famous fact. So this is the combination of the theorem of Herzog, Buchweiss, Breuer, Schreier, and Knerer. So they proved that if R is Gorenstein, then uh, it is a simple singularity if and only if it has finite representation type. So finite representation type means uh, there are only finitely many indecomposable maximum coin coil modules up to isomorphism. Okay. So we can reduce to this corollary. And then we get the above corollary. And then um, the first, so there are two corollaries on this page. And the first one is actually uh, essentially includes the second one. So the first, the first one does not uh, assume that the ring is Gorenstein. So if, I, if you assume that the ring is Gorenstein in the first one, uh, it is almost the same as the second one. Okay, so from now, 
today I will explain uh, classification of resolving subcategories of maximum coin coin modules. So here, here is the main result in this direction. So this is, this theorem B is a combination of my solo paper published in 2010 and my paper with Said Nasser and my paper with Hiron Dao and Toshinori Kobayashi, who is my former PhD student. So let R be a Koi Mokoi local ring. And suppose one of these three conditions. So the first one is uh, R is a hypersurface. And the second one is the maximum idea is quasi decomposable. I would I will soon explain the definition of quasi decomposable in actually in the next page. Okay. And then and also uh, the punctured spectrum, so spec zero R denotes the punctured spectrum, is a hypersurface or has a minimal multiplicity. So this means that so spec zero R is a hypersurface means that uh, if you take any prime idea P in spec zero R, then the local ring R sub P is a hypersurface. So this is the meaning of this phrase. Okay. So this is the second condition. And the third condition is similar to the second one. So the ring R is birch. Again, I will soon explain the definition of birch and the same condition on the puncture spectrum. So then, so as if we have, we are, if uh, one of these three conditions uh, is satisfied, then we have uh, such one-to-one -one correspondence or bijections uh, between the resolving subcategories of maximal coin coin modules and the specialization closed subsets of the singular locus of R. Okay. So the assumption is a bit complicated, but uh, instead uh, we can get all the, uh, so we can get the classification of resolving subcategories of maximal coin coin modules. In, in fact, we can explicitly give, the, the, give this, these two bijections here, so mutually inverse bijections. So uh, in other words, uh, each resolving subcategory contained in CMR is parameterized by some suitable specialization closed subset. So a set of prime idea. Okay. So this is the, our main, second main result. And now let me explain the definition of quasi decomposable and that of Birch. So an idea I is called quasi decomposable if it after modding out by uh, regular sequence, it is decomposable as an as an R module. Okay, so this is the definition of quasi decomposable. And uh, to define the batch ring, we 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 first define need to define the birch ideal. So an ideal I of R is called birch if this holds. So m times i colon m is not equal to m times i. Okay, so this is the definition of Birch ideal. And the definition of a Birch ring is here. So R is called Birch if there exists a ma maximal regular sequence x such that the completion of the quotient is the quotient of a regular local ring by a Birch ideal. So this is the definition. And here are several examples. So first, uh, we can easily construct an example of a Birch ideal. So you, if you take any idea i and take the uh, multiplication or product m times i, then it is always Birch unless it is non, unless it, it is zero. So there are many Birch ideal many, many large ideas. And also if I is an ideal uh, whose depth is zero, then if I is moreover uh, weekly M4, uh, which means that M I column M is equal to I. So this, if this equality holds, then I is called weekly M4. Then 
icebergs. So, but in particular, uh, any integrally closed ideal is birds. Uh, if the wing has positive depth. Okay. Also, R is Gorenstein and Birch, if and only if it is a hypersurface. Okay. So um, basically, Birch wings are important in the non Gorenstein case. This, this says so. And if R is chemically non Gorenstein and has minimal multiplicity, then R is birch, and moreover, the maximum ideal is quasi decomposable. It's also easy. Yeah, actually, you can take the uh, minimal reduction of the maximum ideal, and and it is of course it is uh, generated by a regular sequence, and take the quotient. Then uh, we can reduce to the case where m squared is zero. Then m is uh, k vector. M is a vector space over R mod m. Then we can easily see that R is perch and M is uh, quasi decomposable. And also, we can uh, construct an explicit example here, like this. So let R be a quotient of the formal power series ring in three variables, X, X Y, Z, modulo uh, I2. So this means that the idea generated by two minors. All the two minors of the of this two by three matrix, and a and b are positive integers. Then m is always quasi decomposable. So I think um, many of you know that um, a numerical semigroup ring. There are many examples of a numerical semigroup ring having such a presentation. So this means that uh, there are many examples of a numerical semigroup ring whose maximum ideal is quasi decomposable. Okay. So um, let me, okay, so now let me explain some application, some applications of theorem B. So let R be a local ring and let M and M be two R modules. Then we can actually Yes, we can actually get many rigidity theorems on vanishing of tall or X modules. So here, including these two theorems. So the first one is due to Craig Hunicke and Roger Wigand, uh, published in 1997. So they proved that if R is a hypersurface, then only two consecutive vanishings of tall implies that the either modules Either, module, either, either of the modules appearing in the tall module has finite projective dimension. So they prove this. And also, uh, and, uh, and actually we can recover this corollary by using our classification theorem. Indeed, uh, van uh, so if you, if you are given a vanishing of tall or x, then you can actually a con construct a certain subcategory uh, associated with the vanishing of tor, and we can easily see that it is resolving. So applying our uh, classification of resolving subcategories, uh, we can show such statement. So this is a philosophy behind this page. And also we can recover a theorem of, of Said Nasser, and Sean says a lot of stuff. Uh, similar to the theorem of Hunicke and Wigand. And so M is assumed to be decomposable as an R module. Then again, two con consecutive vanishings of tall. But we need to assume that the in index N is at least five, implies the same conclusion. Okay. And we can also get a quasi decomposable version. Of a, or, or a verge version, or X version. All of all asserts finitely many vanishings in price. Uh, uh, either modules, e either modules appear appearing in the tor or X has finite projective dimension or finite injective dimension or such so, something like that. So, such rigidity theorems can be easily recovered by uh, if we can classify 
リゾーブにするかということです。OK。So, so far,、um, uh, uh, we consider the classification of resolving subcategories, but all of them、uh, have some assumption on the resolving subcategories, which, which are classified. So, from now on,、uh, we want to think of Uh, complete classification of the resolving subcategories. And it, is, it can be done for complete intersections. So, to do this, let me recall the definitions of the, these two definitions. So, the first one is a map. So, a map F is a map F from spec R to the non negative integers is called a grade consistent function. If Its value is at most grade and it's order preserving. If, we if you have an inclusion of prime ideas P and Q, then、uh, the value FP is less than or equal to FQ. Okay? And also,、um, if you are given a complete intersection, R,、uh, which is Of the form S mod x1 through xn. So S is, a, of course, a regular local ring, and x1 through xn is a regular sequence. Then we can define the so called generic hypersurface of R,、uh, which is a graded ring G of this. So it is a quotient of the polynomial ring over S in n variables. So n comes from Here. So n is the length of the regular sequence, modulo this polynomial. Okay. So this is no longer a local ring, but we can, we can define the grading here. So, namely, any element in S has, grade,、uh, has degree zero. Okay. And、uh, any, so each variable has degree one. So that G becomes a graded ring. And then we can define the approach of G. Okay. So now we can、uh, explain our third main result in this talk. So, theorem C. So, let R be a complete intersection as before. Then there is a one to one correspondence between the resolving subcategories of mod R. And the pairs of grade consistent functions and、uh, specialization clause subsets of the singular locus of proj G, where G is the generic hypersurface.、Okay. It is not so simple, but in, anyway, we, we can get all the,、uh, we can get the class, complete classification of the resolving subcategories. So, each resolving subcategory is parameterized by a grade consistent function and specialization cross subs. And this theorem actually comes from the following one、uh, to one correspondence,、uh, which is sort of a, a category version of the, of the Alexander Buchwald theorem stated before. So, we call that the, the Alexander Buchwald theorem is a、uh, uh, Theorem on modules, but this is a theorem on subcategories. So, the resolving subcat there is a one to one correspondence between the, all the resolving subcategories and the pairs of resolving subcategories of finite projective dimensions, modules of finite projective dimensions, and、uh, the resolving subcategories of maximal c o m c o m modules. So, this one to one correspondence lies behind theorem C. In fact,、um, it is known that there is a one to one correspondence between the resolving subcategories of maximal c o i n m a c a u l a y modules and the specialization closed subsets of the singular locus of Proj G. And this is due to Greg Stevenson, who is a representation theorist in, over a co complete intersection, of course. Over, any, over a complete intersection, there is a one to one correspondence between this set and this set. So, it suffices to construct 
a one-to-one -one correspondence between resolving subcategories of uh, modules of finite projective dimension and the weight consistent functions. And then we can get this theorem C. So, and then um, let me explain um, application of theorem C. In fact, we can ask, we can get an answer to our question, original question. So recall that our original question is this. So here, okay, so this is, this is our original question. And then this corollary is obtained from our theorem C. So let R be a regular ring. Of course, philosophically, we can get um, such a result over a complete intersection, but it, it is very complicated. So let me assume that the, the ring is regular. Then uh, the first condition, so there are two, so these two conditions are equivalent. Then the first condition is, says that the question here is affirmative. And the second condition gives an inequality or projective dimension, okay? So this gives a criterion, what we want, uh, which we want. So to see, so if you are given two modules and if you want to know uh, one of them is, uh, if you want to know if one of them is obtained by, obtained from the, un, the other module by taking direct summons extensions and synthesis, you can on you you, are, you have only to check this inequality holds true or not. So this give, this corollary gives a criterion uh, which we want, and also this result this corollary uh, recovers and defines the main theorem of Auslander's ICM lecture, uh, which was given in 1962. Auslander proved that uh, this inequality holds true if and only if uh, some uh, the support of some X modules uh, satisfy something. So such a result is the main result of his talk. And it, it actually, it, it, it actually, uh, it is actually um, uh, obtained from this core and defined. So and uh, let's go back to our original three examples, three examples. So let R be, uh, polynomial ring, then of course R is a, a regular ring, so we can apply the previous corollary. And then uh, we can also to see if to see if these containments hold true or not, we can only check, uh, we, we, we have only to check the inequality of projective dimensions appearing in the corollary. And then, uh, so I don't, I, I don't explain these calculations in detail, but what, they want, what I want to say is that it's easy. <laughs> it's very easy by using the, in, the inequality. It's easy. So you don't need to construct any short exact sequence or something like that. So it's very easy. So this is a benefit uh, obtained by classifying all the resolving subcategories. Okay, so in the next 10 minutes, <laughs> so I only have 10 minutes. Um, uh, again, I, I want to uh, add some assumption uh, on the resolving subcategories which we classify. Because of course, so now uh, we know that over a complete intersection, all, so the, the, all the resolving subcategories are classified. So the classification of uh, resolving subcategories uh, has been done over a complete intersection. So um, probably the next natural step is to think about the complete classification of resolving subcategories over Gorenstein rings. But of course uh, I want to do so, but it's actually very difficult. So uh, there is a very big high, high wall between Gorenstein rings and complete intersections, I think. So again, I, I want to add some suitable assumption on resolving subcategories and uh, get, well, I want to get uh, complete classification of such restricted 
resolving subcategories. So now I want to uh, consider the condition here, dominance. A subcategory X of model R is called dominant if it locally contains the residue field up to direct summons and seizures. To be precise, uh, dominance is given by this uh, condition. It's a bit, a bit complicated. So for each prime P, there is a non-negative integer N, uh, module X in X, such that the N CDZ of the residue field of P over RP, so the, over the local ring RP, is a direct summon of X sub P, so the local localization of X sub P. So this condition is a bit <laughs> complicated, but actually we can get a criterion for a given module to be in the given dominant resolving subcategory. So let X be a dominant resolving subcategory. Then a null module M, M belongs to X if and only if this inequality holds. This inequality of depth holds. So to see, so to see if a uh, given module belongs to a given dominant resolving subcategory or not, uh, you, you can only, you, you, you have only to check this inequality. Then um, uh, we can get this corollary by using theorem B. Let X be a resolving subcategory. Then it is if R is coimacory, then uh, dominance is very simple. So uh, X is dominant if and only if it contains all the maximum coimacory modules. Okay. It's very simple. So uh, the, the definition of dominance. Uh, contains uh, complicated uh, conditions, but if the ring is coin macquarie then the definition is quite simple, just uh, containing all maximum coin macquarie modules. And similarly, if your ring R has finite crew dimension D, then uh, dominance is again simple. So it, it contains D CDZ. So omega D model denotes the collection of all these CZ modules. So such so this this result is obtained by theorem D. We can deduce this theorem, uh, this result from theorem D. And a part of them are already known. So B. D. Sanders proved the first one, uh, assuming there exists a canonical module. And my and uh, and I proved the second statement, assuming that the ring is coin Anyway, so, uh, so, but, and from now on, um, I want to uh, consider um, uh, complete classification of dominant resolving subcategories. And to do, to do this, uh, we introduce a new function on spec R. So a map F on, from spec R to the non-negative integers, is called a moderate function on spec R if its value is at most the depth of the local localization. And if, if you have an inclusion of prime ideas, P and Q, then it satisfies this slightly complicated inequality of depth and height. Okay. So this is the definition of a moderate function. And and uh, it is complicated, a, a little bit complicated, but it is very similar to the definition of great consistent functions. And indeed, there exists a strong connection between these two functions. And a great consistent function is always a moderate function. And if the ring is co and they are the same, both are the same notion. Okay, so in this sense, um, the notion of a moderate function is a, a slight, a natural extension of a great consistent function to the non coin macquarie case. So now uh, let me explain, uh, let me introduce our final main result. So assume that uh, R mod P has a maximum coin macquarie module for each minimal prime P. Then 
we can classify all the dominant resolving subcategories by using moderate functions. And we can also get the, uh, these two maps, so the mutual inverse bijections, explicitly. We can do this. And then, again, um, the methods of theorem E uh, recovers our previous result. So if R is coin McCoy, we uh, so already the dominant resolving subcategories are classified by using grade consistent functions. This is due to I don't know, and myself. And we can recover this by using not not this one. It's not this one, but the methods of or proof of theorem uh, recovers the corollary here. Okay. So uh, finally, let me consider this strange assumption here. So this is actually, I think this is very weak condition, weak assumption. And actually, this says, this means that R mod P satisfies the so-called small coin McCoy modules conjecture for each minimal prime P. Small coin, small coin macaulay modules conjectures conjecture asserts that there exists a maximal coin macaulay module over a ring, okay, over any commutative Nesserian ring. So this holds true for each minimal prime p. So this is the, the meaning of the of the assumption of theorem e, and it is well known or easy to see that the conjecture, this conjecture holds two if R is an excellent, or I think uh, more generally Nagata local ring of dimension at, at most two, because you can just take a suitable minimal prime, uh, suitable quotient by minimal prime and take the integral closure. And then it is maximal coin coin. And here is a famous conjecture due to Melvin Hoxer in 1975. So he conjectured that uh, every complete local ring admits a maximal coin McCoy module, which means that the small coin McCoy module conjecture holds true for any complete local ring. So he conjectured this. So uh, if this conjecture holds true, then we don't need to, uh, we, we can remove the assumption of theorem E for a complete local, for any complete local ring. If this conjecture holds true, so in this sense, um, I think the assumption of theorem E is um, weak enough. But <laughs> but in 2000, 2017, the Hoxha also conjectured that there exists a complete local ring which does not admit a maximum coin coin module. So so of course the, these two conjectures are completely opposite. Okay. So, and also he said in his paper, he says uh, either of these co two conjectures holds true. <laughs> it's of course true. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, so now I don't know, or we don't know if this conjecture holds true in general or not. But anyway, I, what I want to say is that it is not hard to verify the assumption of theorem E for a concrete example, because as all of you know, any commutative Nesserian ring uh, has only finitely many uh, minimal primes. So the assumption of zero me only requires us to check finitely many steps. So for example, for such a ring, for such a concrete example, we can check that minimal prime on, there are only one minimal prime. It is the generate the idea generated by x, and that its quotient is the this form of power series ring, uh, which is of course max uh, coin McCoy ring. So uh, the assumption of theorem E is satisfied. Of course, we know that this is a two-dimensional complete local ring. So we already know that the small coin McCoy modules conjecture holds true for this ring. So we don't need to check the assumption of theorem E, but anyway, so in if you are given a concrete example, it's easy to check, I think. And this example also says that some uh, relationship between 
create consistent functions and moderate functions, but I don't have enough time. So actually my time is already run now. So I, I want to stop my talk here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leo, for your very interesting talk. Thank you. We want to take some questions from audience. If you have any questions, you can unmute and also uh, use your camera to interact. Should I stop the sharing or no? Yeah, very interesting commutative uh, algebra in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a question, maybe I want to start. Mm -hmm. uh, you you mentioned the Huniki Vigand theorem about uh, finite projective dimension if two successive tor modules vanish. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you mentioned that it has a analog for X. Yeah. So so what exactly is the analog, and is that known? Mm, <laughs> precisely. So to be honest, I don't remember. <laughs> huh. But there are many such results. Actually. That it, uh, you mean it it, uh, it will uh, predict whether a module has finite injective dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you have some uh, consecutive vanishings of x modules, then so say x i m n, then mm. uh, either m has finite projective dimension or n has finite injective dimension. So ah, okay. such, a, such a result. And there are many such results, but uh, the conditions are very complicated, and I don't remember. Mm -hmm. mm. So those can also be proved by using category theory. In yeah, 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 classification uh -huh. of resolving subcategories. Okay, yes. okay. And uh, you know, in in one slide you mentioned that there is a there was one to one correspondence between. Um, Resolving subcategories and uh, grade consistent functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in general, suppose my base ring is is a regular local ring. Yes. Uh, it can it have infinitely many grade consistent functions? No, I think uh, of course in dimension one there are only finitely many, but in dimension two uh, there. Are, Basically, un so there are uncountably many height one primes. So, for each height one prime, you can get a uh, grade consistent function, I think. So, there are uncount un uncountably many uh, grade consistent functions. Uh, I, I guess, I guess. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Mm. Yeah, like this. So, this uh, final example. So, this is not a regular local ring, but in, in this uh, so in this case uh, the ring has depth zero so there are only one grade consistent function but the, there are uncountably many moderate functions okay okay mm. so there are many <laughs> yeah okay are there any other questions? Yeah, I, I don't see further questions, but uh, you know, thank you very much for uh, you know your introduction to this very interesting area. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, so uh, we, are, we we have enjoyed your talk, and uh, let's hope that we will meet again. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 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 Marilena, uh, would you like to try? Uh, yes.
Thank you very much. I'm here. Okay. If it works, I think so, but. Yeah. Yeah, we can probably do the five. To connect with my iPad. Yeah. Just one moment. Yeah, sure. I take the same. Uh, let me check the, the code of this. Okay, G F Z. There is someone with uh, the microphone. Uh, so, sorry? Okay, uh, wait, wait just a moment. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> no hurry. <laughs> okay. I'm here. Ah, yeah. I'm here. Yes. And then it should. Uh, Oh. You can click on present. Ah, yes, it's coming up. It's coming. Yeah. Okay. And then I can write. Uh, no, no, you are you. Ah, okay. This is the same. Ah, okay. I thought when I saw some squares, I thought it's some other. <laughs> okay, yes, we can see. The can, you, can you see? Then I can read. Ciao. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, yeah. well, Marina, we are all getting used to this. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I, I hope. <laughs> prefer yeah. because it is easier to take notes for the young people yes then uh, if i can write it's better yeah and, yeah. Uh, yeah i yeah. would uh, i would like to prepare a talk just for the young people in the sense that with some questions open questions or yeah. around yeah. problem and then yeah. uh, Okay, it is clear that by using slides, it's easier to do 